Good afternoon and welcome to today's Downing Street press conference. I'm pleased to be joined today by Dr. Jenny Harris. Let me start by updating you on the latest information from the government's COBRA data file. As of today, 3,348,507 tests for coronavirus have now been carried out in the UK, including 116,585 tests yesterday. 257,154 people have tested positive. That's an increase of 2,900 and 59 cases since yesterday. 9,331 people are currently in hospital with coronavirus, down 11% since last week. And tragically, 36,675 people have now died. That's an increase of 282 fatalities since yesterday, and that's across all settings. This is not just a list of statistics, of course, but a devastating reminder of the cruelty of coronavirus. Our thoughts are with the friends and the families of the victims. As we start to relax the restrictions, we must plan our route to recovery, allowing people to resume their lives where possible, getting businesses up and running again, and building beyond coronavirus. In the short term, We'll, bring, we'll need to bring back more public transport to keep families safe. That process has already begun. Rail and tube services increased at the beginning of this week and they'll ramp up more next month. And to ensure that more buses, trams and light rail networks return to service, today I can announce new investment of £283 million to start moving back to a full timetable. However, I do want to stress, this funding does not mean we can go back to using public transport whenever we like. Remember, those who can should still work from home. Those who can should still avoid all public transport. Even a fully restored service will only be capable of carrying, at best, one fifth of the normal capacity once social distancing is taken into account. So only if you need to travel and you can't cycle or walk or drive should you take a bus, tram or train. But please, avoid the rush hour. We're managing the transport network to make it as safe as possible. This week, we saw the deployment of nearly 3,500 British Transport Police, Network Rail and Transport for London employees. These marshals worked with the public to prevent services from becoming overcrowded. From June 1st, at the earliest, as we move to phase two of the unlock, we'll start to deploy twice as many marshals with the assistance of groups like the charity Volunteering Matters. These journey makers will help provide reassurance, advice, and friendly assistance to commuters. The last time we did this at the 2012 Olympics, it was a great success. And while these are altogether more serious times, if we show the same public spirit of concern for one another, it will go a long way towards helping transport and passengers cope. As I've said, it's essential we stagger our journeys and avoid the rush hour. That's why at a recent roundtable, we asked the tech sector to come up with innovative proposals to help passengers avoid congestion. One good example is Passenger Connect from Birmingham startup Zipabout, a personalised information service which tells rail users how disruption and crowding may affect their journey, while providing alternatives and helping people to maintain social distancing. The service has been successfully piloted over the past 12 months and it will be rolled out soon. We're not just stealing. With the immense challenges of the present, we're building for the future too. Transport's not just about how we get from place to place, it also shapes the places for good or bad, towns, cities, and whole nations. We now have an opportunity to use the power of transport to improve long-standing national weaknesses and create something better. The UK's unbalanced economy is one such weakness. Our mission is to level up Britain. 
The COVID outbreak must be the catalyst to get it done, levelling up and speeding up. So while roads and railways are less busy, we're acceler accelerating vital projects. Take the North, for example. This bank holiday weekend, we're carrying out vital work to fix Leeds Station, continuing to build a new platform, installing new points and switches, and improving the track to Wakefield. Just part of 490 separate engineering projects happening around the country this bank holiday weekend. Work that would normally take months of weekend closures are much quicker on these quieter railways. And we're getting on with plans to reverse some of the so-called beaching rail cuts too. Dr. Beeching wrote a report back in the 1960s which led to the closure of one third of our railway network. 2,363 stations, 5,000 miles of track identified for closure. Many of the places removed from the map never recovered. That report was perhaps the origin of the left behind town, but we're working to reverse beaching. The process has already started in Blythe in the northeast and Fleetwood in the northwest. I visited in January and also took the opportunity to visit Horden Peter Lee to see the station building work. There used to be a train station 200 yards away, but it was closed and the town cut off by the beaching axe. This new station will connect a community of over 50,000 people, improving their quality of life. And today, the next 10 schemes to benefit are announced. It's development funding, but if they stack up, then we're going to build them fast. Amongst the many schemes is the reinstatement of the Ivanhoe line in the East Midlands, from Leicester to Burton via Colville and Ashby, and branch lines on the Isle of Wight, and a new station at Wellington uh, in Somerset. But no matter how great we make the railways of the future, millions will still rely on the car. That's why today, I'm publishing the preferred route to complete the dual carriageway on the A66 from Scotch Corner to Penrith. The first new all dual carriageway across the Pennines in 50 years. This is a £1 billion programme that will transform the capacity by upgrading junctions and widening the road. These road and rail schemes will be the first of many, binding our country together, connecting people with jobs. But it isn't just the balance between regions that we need to reshape. It's hard to see millions who, until a few weeks ago, commuted by train into Manchester, London, Birmingham, every day, will immediately go back to the same old ways. So we have to reshape our towns and cities too. The Prime Minister once said, cities are where inspiration and innovation happens, because people can bump into each other, spark off one another, compete, collaborate, invent, and innovate. That's when we get the explosion or flash of creativity and innovation. And yet, with social distancing, it makes all that rather more difficult. So we have to find new ways of making it happen. Therefore, as conditions allow, and not until July, we'll be looking to support creative ways for businesses to reopen whilst maintaining social distancing. We know restaurants and bars will want to start trading again and we'll work with them so we can enjoy an outdoor summer in a safe and responsible environment. For those who live too far to cycle and walk and must drive to major conurbations, we'll repurpose parking in places just outside town centres. So people can park on the outskirts and finish their journeys on foot or bike or even e-scooter. Our aim with these measures is not merely to get through the lifting of restrictions and then return to how things were, but to come out of this recovery stronger by permanently changing the way we use transport. Take the bike, for example. Previously, we announced the introduction of a scheme to help bring bicycles back into a roadworthy condition, relieving the pressure on public transport and improving the nation's health. Today, I can provide the detail of the new £50 bicycle maintenance voucher. Available from next month, the scheme will help up to half a million people drag bikes out of retirement, speeding up the cycling revolution, helping individuals become fitter and healthier, and reducing air pollution, which remains a hidden killer. 
Clean air should be as big a priority for us in the 21st century as clean water was to the Victorians in the 19th. Measures discussed measures that will help more passengers, will help more passengers, buses, trains, 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 safe and trams, more commuters to take up, commuters to take up, and more people to benefit more from infrastructure improvement infrastructure than the Normans have the Northern power house across the country. Across the country. They give us all, they give us opportunity and harness the power, harness the power. Not just to help us, not just to help the lives turn to the lives of the world, post COVID, to make our economy, but to make our more resilient, more resilient, healthier nation, and to change our nation. I'd like to turn now. I'd like to, to turn now to, to Harry to take us through the Harry to take us through the slides. Thank you. Thank you. First slide. Thank you. First slide, please. Uh, so we're going Thank to we're uh, going to uh, through, have you to look, the, look through some of the uh, data uh, that we are collating going forward uh, through the pandemic. Uh, and get some insights as to uh, how the population is behaving, uh, but most importantly, what is happening to the disease. So on the first slide, uh, on the left, you can see uh, the insights which are gathered from Google Mobility data. It won't cover uh, everybody on all user groups, but it gives a good indication of what the population is doing and how they're moving around. And what we can see is a very significant drop in usage uh, to workplaces, to transit stations and retail and recreation, uh, th which has been largely maintained through uh, the pandemic. Clearly, in the middle, we can see grocery and pharmacy, people needing to use that. Um, and then the blue line in the middle, uh, with people starting to use parks more in line with the national guidance. Uh, the only thing I would say there is that if people are using parks, which is good for mental health, for physical activity, uh, please do remember to maintain social distancing while using them. Uh, so staying two metres away from people outside your household and just meeting with one other person. Uh, on the right-hand side, you can see uh, an ONS Opinions and Lifestyle Survey data. So both of these sets of data go back to about a week ago. And we can see that uh, a significantly larger number of people, 41% uh, of the pop of employed adults, are working from home. And that's compared to just around 12% last year. And, and we know that 86% of adults have left their home. Uh, we know that 80% of those are for uh, basic necessities and around 71% for exercise, uh, for a run, for a walk or a cycle. Again, all in accordance with national guidance, um, which we uh, would encourage. Next slide, please. So this is the uh, slide showing the current uh, situation with testing and new cases. Uh, so on the left-hand side, you can see the data in relation to testing. Uh, and the top number there, 116,585, represents all the tests in all the different systems uh, that have been completed or taken or sent out, whether it be through labs, uh, in hospitals, wherever it may be, up until 9 o'clock on the 23rd of May, which brings the national total well over 3,348,000. Three, uh, 3, uh, and from that testing, we can see that we've got 2,959 new confirmed cases uh, as of this morning. Um, and uh, that brings our UK total to 257,154. Um, and the graphs on the right clearly show that. I think the important thing is that there is a trend upwards in our daily testing, which we expect to continue as uh, track and trace uh, comes in. Um, it varies a little bit over weekends, but generally the trend is up. Uh, but very encouragingly, despite the increased upward trend in testing, we are maintaining a downward trend in new confirmed cases. Next slide, please. Uh, so this guy, uh, slide gives uh, a picture of uh, both the activity in our hospitals uh, and also uh, of some of the uh, important life-saving equipment, which is one of the issues we were very concerned about at the start of the pandemic. Uh, so on the right, we can see that there's been a steady but continuing slow uh, downward trend in new daily admissions to hospitals uh, in England from COVID-19, uh, right down from a peak uh, which reached over 3,000 uh, around the first week of April. And that translates in numbers to 675 uh, estimated emissions on the 21st of May, uh, again down from 736 on the 14th of May. 
And then on the bottom part of the slide, on the right-hand graph, uh, right across all the UK countries, we can see that the uh, demand for mechanical ventilator beds uh, was high again just after that peak as people uh, went through significant illness uh, about the middle of April, and that's now come down in all countries. And when we look over at the statistics on the left-hand side, we can see that 12% of the mechanical ventilator beds are occupied with COVID-19 patients. So uh, significant capacity, uh, which was never breached and in fact is down by 5% on the week before. Next slide. Uh, so when we look at the number of people in hospital with COVID-19, uh, 9,331 9, people uh, in hospital now, and that's down by over 1,000 from this time last week. And we can see in the slides, uh, despite the varying shapes across the different UK countries and regions, uh, that this is a downward trend in all areas. It varies. Um, different, different places have had uh, different peaks and at very slightly different times. But generally, right across the UK, uh, the number of cases is coming down. Next slide, please. Um, and then finally, and sadly, uh, over the last uh, 24 hours, we have had 282 uh, reported deaths, uh, which have been confirmed with a positive test, which uh, brings our total to 36,675. Um, however, uh, on the only positive note from that uh, number is that we can see that the, the deaths are starting continuously to come down. The bar chart here always uh, depicts a little bit of a reporting uh, uh, change over the weekend periods, but the rolling average, so where we're looking to see on average what is happening, that is continuing to come down, and we will be looking to expect that to come down further. Jenny, thank you very much indeed. Um, we're going to turn now to questions. We're going to start with questions from the public. It's worth mentioning that we don't know the questions that are going to be asked. They're picked by an independent uh, polling uh, company. And we'll turn, first of all, to Gordon uh, from Gosport. How is the government going to prevent travellers staying in the Irish Republic at the end of their holidays to bypass the UK's 14-day quarantine? Thank you very much, um, Gordon. Well, I think the, um, the, the point that people uh, may not be aware of is that Ireland has a, uh, a, um, a, a travel ban, effectively, as well. So they also, at the moment, have a quarantine uh, in place. Um, so it, it is you know, the case that uh, that may change in the future. Of course, we'll keep our system under uh, review in the future. But for the time being, uh, whether somebody travels to Dublin or somebody travels to, to London, the same essential uh, quarantine would, uh, would apply. Uh, can I turn to uh, Sarah uh, from Newbury? And I think this is a text for me to read. How is the... Sorry, you currently test people uh, with symptoms from the age of five and over. Uh, will there be some guarantee that this will be extended to under fives once early year settings are opened? If not, how are we supposed to justify to our staff members and the wider community that it's safe to open? Um, and it's probably one for you, Jenny. Thank you. Yes, so it's very important that when we are doing tests, we're doing tests which we know will give uh, true, true answers, uh, have high sensitivity and high specificity. Um, and so uh, we are always looking to find new tests going forward. For the time being, uh, this is for over fives, and most of the children going back will be around this age. Uh, clearly, uh, often we have slightly different ways of approaching uh, medicines, for example, or testing with young children, because it's very important that the tests, uh, the results, or the medicines, the treatments, are calibrated to uh, growing children, if it's medicine, or are interpreted correctly for a small child. And of course, uh, you're right in the sense we are still learning about some of the uh, disease in children. But what we do know is that children uh, rarely become very ill with this. Um, and there is a suggestion and lots of data, I think, in the public domain now, uh, where we're getting a signal that uh, the transmission from children is also potentially reduced. So for children over five, it will be ready for schools uh, to use and for their families as well and for the teachers. Um, for children under five, obviously, that we will progress that going forward. Jenny, thanks very much indeed. We'll turn now to journalists and uh, Ian Watson of the BBC. 
I suppose it's quite appropriate we've got the Transport Secretary with us today because I was hoping you and indeed Dr Harris could clarify some of the guidance around travelling during lockdown. It seemed to me that the guidance was pretty clear actually. If you have symptoms, you self-isolate for seven days and the rest of your household stays at home for 14 days. But is the advice now to parents that if you don't have your own extended family nearby, even when you are ill with COVID symptoms, you are allowed to leave your home, travel many miles across the country and isolate closer to your extended family? And a specific question to you, uh, Mr Sharps. Um, did the Prime Minister know that his advisor, Dominic Cummings, had travelled 250 miles or more during lockdown? And did he approve this? Thanks very much. Did you mean the first question to Jenny? Um, I'd like the views of both of you, actually, but certainly I'd, I'd value Jenny's advice uh, specifically on whether uh, parents who are ill can leave their home to go closer to their extended family to isolate. So the, the scientific and medical advice behind the self-isolation is obviously to take people who are symptomatic uh, out of the public domain and anybody who may be uh, likely to develop that and households tend to have the same exposures so we know there's a greater risk. So as you say, uh, the advice is you uh, self-isolate at home, your family self-isolate with you and that's very clear. Uh, I think built into that guidance along with all of our other guidance, so for example for uh, elderly people or those who are clinically extremely vulnerable and are advised to stay at home and they have accepted uh, and, and wanted to take forward that advice, there is always an element which says safeguarding. So we don't want an elderly person sitting at home without their medication because they feel they can't come out. Uh, if there is a safeguarding issue and a child, for example, uh, is uh, significantly unwell and has no support, that is equally uh, uh, another issue. But uh, those are the interpretation, that's the clinical advice around that. There's always a safeguarding clause in all of the advice, whether it is this or for clinically extremely vulnerable, um, the, the interpretation of that advice is uh, probably for others. Uh, and Ian, you're asking if the Prime Minister uh, uh, knew. Um, look, the important thing is that everyone remains in, in, um, in, in the same place whilst they're, uh, whilst they're locked down, uh, which is exactly what happened in, I think, the case you're uh, referring to uh, with Mr uh, Cummings. So the Prime Minister will have known he was staying put and he didn't come out again until he was feeling better. I'll just come back to you. Yeah, but he did travel 250 miles from his London home, did he not? And again, to you and to Dr Harris, you seem to be very clear about when people can leave their home, Dr Harris. That is, for example, uh, if they're seeking uh, you know, uh, food, medical supplies, caring for the vulnerable. Let me give you one specific example. If someone is ill and the other parent is not at that time showing symptoms and they have a young child, should they leave their home when ill to go to another home 250 miles away. Is that in line with the guidance? Well, sorry, I, I can go first. I'll go, I'll, I'll go first. Um, Ian, the guidance says, um, if you're living with children, uh, keep following this advice to the best of your ability. However, however, we are aware that not all these measures will be possible, depending, therefore, um, on, on circumstances. I'm adding those last few words. In other words, if you are in a position where you've got a young child, in this case four years old, uh, and uh, you need, are worried about the welfare of that child and your ability to throw around them the wider uh, network of support, um, then you know, clearly being somewhere where other members of the family uh, can assist, uh, by which I mean, uh, in this case, uh, younger uh, other members of the um, family, um, then that might be the best place for you to settle and stay uh, throughout the uh, time that you're ill. And I think that's all that's uh, happened in, in this case. And you are asking part of the question to Jenny, so... Well. I was just simply really going to re repeat what I said before. I think we have always said in the guidance what we don't want to do, and it relates to people being treated in hospital and staying out of hospital as well, uh, we don't want to cause uh, harm uh, through advice which uh, keeps people at home when they are at risk. That doesn't, that's not directly referring to any current issues. It's the clinical uh, and technical advice, which is we want people to come out of circulation. Uh, we want them to self-isolate the minute they have symptoms and to stay out of circulation if there is a critical issue, a safeguarding issue, regardless of whether it's a child, uh, an elderly person or anybody else, uh, then there, is, uh, there needs to be some sort of safeguard in place. Thank you very much, uh, Ian. We'll turn now to uh, Sam Coates from Sky.
Secretary of State, how can you personally be sure that by driving halfway across England, Dominic Cummings didn't infect anyone else on the way or while he was there? Or frankly, do you not think it would have mattered? And what do you say today to all those people who are unable to say goodbye to their loved ones or go to their funerals because they were observing the letter of the rules, seemingly unlike uh, the PM's top aide? And to Jenny Harries, you said if adults were unable to look after small children, they might resort to other family members. And number 10 say that this is analogous to the situation involving Dominic Cummings. But is it really if one of the two parents doesn't have coronavirus, as the number 10 statement today does seem to suggest? How can you preempt a situation by traveling halfway across the, uh, the country in order to uh, seek further protection. Would that, where did you say that was, a, in, was within the rules uh, in previous press conferences or in guidance? Sam, thanks very much. Um, look, I think for everybody who's lost loved ones, everyone who's had, we've, everybody has been impacted by this um, crisis and everyone has uh, done their best to uh, try to uh, do the right things. The, as I read out before, I won't repeat the guidance again, um, but it does essentially uh, it interpret it as, as taking practical steps to uh, ensure uh, that you follow the measures uh, as best as possible in order to uh, prevent, um, for example, in this case, a four-year-old child from ending up without having uh, the necessary support that a four-year-old would quite obviously require. Um, so that was the decision uh, taken in, in that situation. Uh, and look, I, I, I understand what you're saying. I get what you're saying. You know, um, Mr Cummings is a, you know, in the public eye. But the reality of the matter is that a four-year-old child's welfare, I think, is the important thing. Parents will ask themselves what they would do if they had no other support uh, around. Uh, and eventually, you'd either have to uh, turn to external uh, support, not from your family, or try and be close enough to your family to provide that, uh, that care, which is what happened uh, in this case here. And I understand that um, his sister and, uh, I think, a niece, who are younger, from the younger generation, were able to um, provide uh, food and bring things to the property they were staying in, which was not inside their uh, his parents' house. So I think it was a sort of a, a uh, uh, you know a straightforward arrangement that meant he stayed in the same place uh, and uh, prevented uh, possibility of um, the uh, child in this case um, from not having uh, support around him. Uh, and your second point was to Jenny. Yeah, so I will reiterate probably what I've just said, which is the public health advice is take yourself out of uh, society, if you like, as soon as you have symptoms, stay at home, stay at home with your family. Um, I, I don't know the details of this specific case, and I'm commenting on the, the, the technical and, and medical advice. Uh, I think the point, uh, I haven't got the detail of the comment from a previous breast briefing, but I think the question I was asked was if, if two adults were ill and unable to to cope uh, or care for a small child who was totally dependent on them, uh, was that a, a reason to seek external support? And I would just go back to say all of the guidance has uh, a, a common sense element to it, uh, which includes uh, safeguarding around adults or children. So I think that would account for that answer. Sam, I just want to give you a chance to come back. Um, uh, Secretary of State, could, could you just clear up factually what went on? So Mr Cummings went to a Durham property and he stayed inside that with his wife and child all in the same property and members of their family delivered food to their doorstep. Why did that necessitate that journey 260 miles? Why couldn't he have done that in London? Well, I guess it's where his uh, family was. Yes, those are the facts as I understand them, um, Sam. I, I guess the, the simple answer is that's where the family was. That's where his sister was uh, and, uh, and the niece. So... You know, as we all do in moments of um, crisis, we, we, we always seek to have our family, uh, those who can assist us uh, around us. And I think that's, that's all that's happened in this case. I'm afraid I don't know, I don't, I'm afraid I don't know the, the personal circumstances, the extent of which support network could have helped where, but he clearly went to where the family was, stayed there, didn't then move around, uh, and only came back to London for work, which is obviously allowed as one of the four reasons, uh, when fully better and uh, after the required period of time. Thanks very much, Sam. Can we go to Dave Wood of ITV? Thank you, Secretary of State. Uh, throughout this lockdown, particularly phase one of it, people have been making some very difficult choices about how close they get to their family, who they see and where they stay, sometimes in the most heartbreaking of circumstances. 
Should those people have been using their own interpretation then of the stay at home message? Thanks, David. Um, look, I think I mean, the reality is that, that people should, of course, follow the guidance. I, I won't bore you by reading it again, but it very clearly says uh, you should follow the guidance to the best of your, uh, your ability uh, and, uh, and um, follow the measures uh, as much as is possible. And then it's for an individual to make the decision. How do I make sure I've got enough support around the family, particularly in the case that you're referring to, with a, uh, a potential of both parents ending up being ill uh, and having a young child to look after. How do you have that support network around them? Uh, and uh, the decision here was to go to that location and stay in that location. They didn't then move around uh, from there. Uh, and, uh, and so it will be for each individual to work out the best way uh, to do that, uh, which is what's happened here. Can I just check then, is, is the message you're giving us this evening that anyone who becomes ill with this, if they can go close to family, no matter how far that journey is, they can do so that the family members can supply food and not friends who may live locally. And to Dr. Harris, if I may, just remind us, what are the risks of traveling if you have the virus and would you recommend it? Well, on, on the first point, of course, the rules have subsequently changed anyway. So you can now travel if you are uh, not symptomatic uh, any distance in order to, uh, for example, exercise. Uh, and that is something which uh, people are aware of uh, now. You go as far as if you had the symptoms, could you travel as far no. as possible to stay no. in a house closer to relatives? No. I mean, as, as I already, I think, already explained, you know, you have to um, get yourself sort of um, locked down uh, and do that in the, the, the best and most practical way. And I think that will be different for different people under uh, whatever circumstances they, their particular family differences happen to uh, dictate. That's all that's happened uh, in this case. Uh, he was there, he stayed there. Uh, and, you know, I don't, I can carry on answering it, but it was, it's the same answer each time. And there was a second point to Jenny. Yeah, so, I mean, the key public health messages uh, from a professional perspective are if people have symptoms, they should self-isolate immediately and stay in their homes. Um, the only exception around this is around risk, and that's uh, the issue of safeguarding for children or adults, and I think I've, I've said that. In relation to the, uh, the risk of travel, uh, clearly in travel advice that we're giving, uh, if you're in a, a private car, uh, actually transmission within a, within a vehicle, uh, because it's an enclosed space and you're relatively close together, is probably a higher risk one, but you're usually within, if you're within a household group, uh, then your exposures are usually the same. Uh, and if you travel from A to B and you're not meeting anybody else, then there's no possibility uh, of a risk passing on, uh, so, which is why in much of the guidance you'll see, we say if you're traveling, travel in your own car for people, for example, going to have a test taken, uh, they can't go on public transport, they go in a car. Uh, um, and that's a simple, simple answer. David, thank you very much. Let's turn now to Chris Hope from Daily Telegraph. Chris. Hello, Mr. Shapps. So may I ask uh, quickly, um, you said there that the PM knew Mr. Cummings was staying put. When did the PM know he'd gone to Durham? And can I ask Dr. Harries, um, did you know that he'd gone to Durham? And does Mr. Cummings' decision to go this far during lockdown undermine the stay-at-home message which you're doing so much to, to publicise? Um, Chris, I'm sorry to disappoint you. I don't know exactly uh, the, the answer to when the PM knew, uh, but I, knew that the, I know the PM knew that he was uh, unwell and that he was locked down. Of course, the PM was also unwell um, during the same period in, in uh, reference. I can tell you the PM uh, provides uh, Mr. Cummings with his full support, uh, and uh, Mr. Cummings has provided a, a, a full statement. And I think it's perfectly right that questions are asked, and you're all asking the same questions, and not I appreciate about the transport, significant transport uh, announcements, the upgrading of the A66 to dual carriageway and a billion pounds uh, to make people's lives better and faster to connect there. And I appreciate that. Uh, but, uh, you know, I do think it's important to, uh, to, to note that questions were asked, quite rightly, uh, and the questions have been answered because Mr Cummings has produced a um, statement uh, which you will no doubt have read. And I think the second point was to you, Jenny. Yes. Um, so in the same way that uh, as, a, as a doctor I wouldn't comment on the clinical position of an individual, I have no detail uh, of in this particular case and I'm not going to comment on that. Um, but in relation to the advice to the public, uh, absolutely clear that public health guidance is if you're symptomatic, 
you stay at home, take yourself out of society as quickly as you can with your family and stay there uh, unless there is that extreme uh, risk to life. Um, and, and that is a really important message. People have been really good at doing that, but it's vital that we continue to do that going forward because that also underlies the track and trace system as well. Um, and we're going to be asking people to do that if they're identified as a contact. Chris, I can see you waiting to get back in. Thank you, Mr. Chaps. One final question. Can you clarify whether anyone from Durham Constabulary spoke to any member of Mr. Cummings' family, please? Well, quite literally reading from Mr. Uh, Cummings' statement, at no stage was he or his family spoken to by the police about this matter. Does that mean the police are not telling the, the, what happened straightforwardly? I'm not sure where the confusion in that comes in, but uh, we've got it in black and white there in this statement. Uh, Chris, thank you very much indeed. Can I turn to um, David Wooding, The Sun on Sunday. David. Uh, Secretary of State, we've already had two resignations from senior aides uh, who have broken the rules in Neil Ferguson and north of the border, Catherine Calderwood. So the public could be forgiven for thinking there's one rule for us and one rule for the rest of them. And even among aides, aides may be thinking there's one rule for us aides, but uh, a different rule for uh, the Downing Street aides. What is, uh, what is different about Dominic Cummings and other people who've resigned in senior positions over their movements? David, thank you. Um, look, I think what most people will probably be thinking watching this is what would I do in that situation? I've got a young child, uh, my wife is unwell, uh, I'm worried um, about the ability to support uh, the child as a father. Do you then uh, end up saying, well, you know, we'll take the best possible option in order to be able to provide the uh, ongoing care for that child and therefore go to where there's a, a network but not go to inside the, the, the parent's house, house but rely on the younger generation? Um, and and that's, the, that's obviously the, the question that will have to be made. And I, I would draw this distinction. This wasn't sort of visiting a holiday home or going to visit someone. This was to stay put uh, for 14 days to remain in isolation, to get over what I uh, understand was quite a significant uh, bout of uh, illness uh, from coronavirus, uh, and then to be able to return to London only when well and uh, properly uh, in line to do a job that uh, couldn't be done from elsewhere. So I think there's every difference uh, to answer your question directly. Yeah, I know, I know you're not being evasive on the question of whether, when and whether the Prime Minister knew about this, but I think that's an important uh, question that needs answering. If you're unable to answer that, then I, I think the public do have a right to know what the Prime Minister knew about Mr Cummings' visit and when he was told about it. Yes, well, as I say, I think the Prime Minister was, in at least part of this period, possibly in, in hospital. I haven't um, matched up the exact dates, but I do know that the Prime Minister knew that uh, he was uh, you know, quite properly staying put in one place with his family. Uh, which is the, the right thing to do, not leaving uh, after doing that. All the right things to do. And as I said uh, a moment ago, the Prime Minister gives Mr Cummings his full uh, support. Can I turn to uh, Matsataza Ali Shah, please, from GEO News. Hi, Secretary of the State. Uh, ahead of opening up the, uh, relaxing the rules and opening up the transport network, uh, my question is, what measures are being taken to protect the frontline workers and of who belong to ethnic minorities? Uh, the same communities who have suffered quite a lot you know, after the COVID-19 outbreak, be it in the National Health Service or in the transport network or other essential services. Matassa, it's a great question because um, you know, I'm very concerned to make sure that the right equipment is with everybody under the right circumstances. So on the transport network, if you are, um, for example, a train driver and you're in a cab, um, then you know, quite clearly you're not uh, in constant uh, sort of contact with other people. On the other hand, in other forms of transport, and buses in some cases, for example, you could be in very close contact. So it's, what we absolutely have to do is make sure that we have the right level uh, of protection for people in different circumstances. And on this subject, what I've done is to write to the transport operators uh, in hand in hand with uh, Public Health England uh, to make sure that they're aware of all the correct equipment that uh, should be uh, in place, procedures, processes, uh, things like cordoning off, uh, and also thinking about um, the flow of passengers and that type of thing in order to protect uh, their transport workers. 
I should say that very sadly, 53 transport workers have died during um, coronavirus. Um, we don't know all of the circumstances or that it was necessarily connected to uh, their work, but it is you know, of great concern. Um, and it's worth saying that uh, we've asked uh, Professor Fenton uh, to carry out some research because, and I'm very concerned, that people from the BAME communities seem to have been affected more. We also know men are affected more. We also know obesity seems to play a part. Uh, and uh, Professor Fenton's uh, initial report on this from Public Health England will be available, I think, at the end of this month, uh, which will be very helpful as well. Can I invite you to uh, come back in? Unless you don't. Do you want to come back in again? I think we may have lost the line. Matazza, can you hear us? Yes, yes. Oh, yeah. Did you want to come back in again? Yes, again, uh, but I think you have clearly mentioned it, but also, you know, there is a very uh, concern within these communities that uh, are probably, you know, within the National Health Service, uh, I mean, a lot of people have died and, and there are real tragic stories, you know, people who get in touch with us from the ethnic minorities members, Indians, Pakistanis, Bangladeshis, who have suffered a lot. My question is, is government uh, preparing or thinking of probably uh, maybe announcing some compensation or maybe some other source of measure for these families who have suffered or, or families who have, you know, the people who, who, have, who have lost their lives and have left their families in, in kind of situation where, where it is difficult for them to make two ends meet? Yeah. Um, well, it's absolutely, I mean, it's heartbreaking um, to see how this um, virus developed and um, you, many of the people, as you mentioned, on the uh, front line may come from um, ethnic minorities. We don't know whether that's because of the propensity for people to be on the front line uh, from BAME backgrounds or whether there's something else happening, and that's what Professor Fenton will help to get to the uh, bottom of. It's certainly the case that in the NHS and the care world, um, there is a, a, a package that the Health Secretary announced previously of support uh, where there is a deceased member uh, of the family. And it's got, there's also sort of uh, in, in work uh, uh, service uh, payouts in other circumstances as well, though not in quite the, the same way. Um, and so we are you know, very, very concerned about um, people from all sorts of different backgrounds. And you will have heard in the last couple of days that we've also changed the rules to make sure that people can have um, uh, to rights of uh, rights to stay uh, if a member of their family uh, was working, uh, particularly in the NHS, uh, and then uh, sadly uh, died through coronavirus. Um, so that's um, sort of um, means of residence for those individuals. And so a range of different measures, absolutely at the forefront of what the government wants to uh, do to get to the bottom of this and make sure that all the right lessons are learned. And I say there's some unusual groups including um, people from ethnic minorities, but also the way that this has tended to uh, impact on uh, men, uh, people with obesity and other categories uh, as well. And we will absolutely get to the bottom uh, of all of those things. Thank you very much. I, I wanted to conclude by saying that uh, we've come a very long way uh, through this um, disease and uh, we're taking a whole range of different steps, some of which I was describing from a transport point of view, uh, to try to make sure that transport can be safe and secure for people uh, to travel on um, going forward. But it's absolutely crucial to remember that the transport system will not be able to take the normal numbers of people. So please look for alternatives. Please consider uh, not traveling at peak uh, and ideally traveling by walking, cycling, uh, or indeed driving uh, instead. Finally, it's a bank holiday weekend. Um, so please look after everybody and stay alert. Thank you very much. <laughs>